tonight, we want to have a conversation. So I would like to invite my husband Gabriel and Lindsay Kaiser. Go ahead and come forward and let's take a seat. Yes, come on, give it up for Lindsay Kaiser. Yay. Um, you can have a seat, baby. You'll sit right here in the, in the white chair just to break up the estrogen. I mentioned this last, last week, but I have a spiritual son that I've been walking closely with through this life issue. And um, I, many of you, I've discussed this with many of you that I've had a chance to meet with that have struggled in this area. And what I really was tired of seeing is that the, ch is the church treating this issue, this sin issue, as different than other kind of promiscuity, other kind of sexual sin, or other kind of sin in general, right? And so when I, when I was walking through this, I'm still walking through this with um, one of my spiritual sons, I didn't know, I felt like it was above my, my pay grade. You know, I felt like it was above my understanding, like, to have this um, attraction that, that he's had since a, a small boy that he feels is very much a part of him. He feels it's is, is who he is. Like, how do I talk to him about, um, no, that's not who you are. Or that's not God's best for you. And so I felt like I was hitting walls. But I was determined, Lindsay, to say to him, I'm not going to leave your side in this. And we're going to walk this together. And I'm going to weep with you. And I'm going to cry with you. And I'm going to ask God the difficult questions. But, like, let's go deep into this. And so finally, we, we read a book together. That's kind of what we knew to do. But then the Lord brought Lindsay Kaiser into my life in February of 2022. <laughs> and this woman is a gift to this house. Even if you don't know her, she's a gift to you. She has been such a treasure for me, such um, a help and support and listening sister and has helped walk me through some things. Um, why don't you tell her, tell them the story or do you want me to introduce them? Okay, so before we get into this conversation, Lindsay, why don't you just share a little bit of your story with us so they can know your background for those who've not heard before and then we'll get into some questions. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so at a very early age, my earliest memories are of um, hypersexual play with my girlfriends, um, a very abnormal amount. And I, I was gifted with this powerful gift of uh, being highly sensitive and very intuitive. And I would also feel and sense the emotions and the atmosphere of the world around me. And it was very overwhelming. And coupled uh, with that kind of play as I really turned to childhood masturbation um, to alleviate the pain. And from, a, from uh, my earliest memories are, are of same-sex attraction, even by the age of six, there was already gender insecurity. And I was asking the Lord to make me a boy. And I was literally crying out to him uh, to change my gender. And uh, at the age of nine, I unfortunately was exposed to some of the most graphic lesbian porn that I've ever seen in my life. And it was also in the context of being with my girlfriends. And um, so I lived in this prison of shame and self-hatred. And I uh, unfortunately had some shaming experiences that taught me to hide. And so I just hid away with all of these um, very consuming uh, issues. And, um, you know, fast forward, uh, I go off to college, and that's when I start acting out on my same-sex desires. And I would live publicly by hooking up with a bunch of guys, but in private, I was hooking up with my closest girlfriends. And in my uh, young adult years, um, I had moved to Washington, D.C., and it was there that the Lord actually got a hold of me. And he did it by um, me hitting rock bottom. And everything kind of crumbled down, and Jesus was the only, only person left. And um, because of that, I, I fell madly in love with the Lord 
Um, there's obviously more of a story here, but I'm trying to be quick. And the Lord started to radically transform my life. And I uh, miraculously was healed of being able to read, and I began reading the word of God, and it was so alive. The spirit of, of wisdom and revelation was, a, was upon it, and it was beginning to transform my heart. And I entered into five beautiful years of transformation, of healing, and uh, after that, unfortunately, like I wish that was just the end of my story, uh, but it's not. And I ended up having some compounding trauma uh, related to the closest person to me suddenly passing away and some trauma in and around that, that really um, kind of set the stage for uh, really feeling abandoned by God. I was used to in those five years of the manifest presence of God and in like one-on-one -on -one with him in the secret place. And after that, after that trauma happened, it was as if he completely disappeared and abandoned me. And I became very offended. And in pride, I told the Lord, you know, if this really is a relationship, it takes two of us and you're not here. And so I'm not here anymore. And so unfortunately, I walked away from the Lord and I fell away. And I was in a, a very dark period for five, five whole years and I ended up letting in everything that the Lord had healed and delivered me from. I let it all back in. And it started with, with the alcohol and the alcohol abuse. And then it just led into, um, you know, lesbian relationships. I ended up falling in love with a woman and wanted to marry her. Uh, but by the grace of God, um, that didn't happen. Uh, but my heart was shattered and it was soon after that that I was resolved to commit suicide. And I attempted uh, to take my life. And the Lord supernaturally um, brought someone into my home and intervened while I was literally in the act of doing that. And um, unfortunately, life didn't get better uh, right after that. But um, I became very weary and... There was something in me that was still holding on and fighting, even though I had completely walked away. And I kind of told the Lord, at, you know, kind of closer into the, the latter part of that fifth year, all right, I, I think I'm ready to come back. And I ended up um, initiating back with the Lord. And things didn't immediately uh, get better but the Lord actually gave me answers to why he went silent on me. And I began to tell the Lord um, that he could keep himself or, or myself in a place of hiddenness for as long as he wanted. Like there was, there was something of wisdom that the Lord was doing. And um, it was out of that, that that things really started to accelerate. And the Lord actually took me out of my environment. He took me out of Washington, D.C., and he moved me down to Jacksonville, Florida, and he put me with a very prophetic group of people. And the Lord beginning, began to minister to my spirit um, more than my soul, and my spirit started getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And in that, it also opened the door to go into deeper places of healing in my soul with the Lord. But while I was in Jacksonville, the Lord um, really highlighted the ministry of intercession and uh, called me as an intercessor into this issue area and uh, has commissioned me to do that. And that's kind of where I'm at today. Um, I got to I got to thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for being so vulnerable. Um, and I will say when I first met you, I felt so much hope because up until that point, Everyone that I had ever met that struggled with same-sex attraction, um, it, I didn't really know anyone who was free, to be honest. I didn't know anyone who was free. You were the first free person, truly free person I had ever met. And before that, I was like, I don't even know if it's possible because what I was hearing from young adults that really wrestle with this is, this is a part of who I am. This is my identity. And, and it was almost like this um, pulling away 
and, and of, of the person. And I'm like, I, I know there's freedom. I know it's possible because Jesus says it in the word of God. And I believe the word. I just need to see someone who's actually living it out. And you were the first sign and wonder that I saw. And now I've known, now I see many more. But I just want to thank you for being vulnerable to share your story. Yeah, and I'd love to speak into that a little bit if that's yes. cool with you. Yes. Um, yeah, I... I mean, this, the the feelings and the struggle uh, is very real. It is. It feels all consuming. It feels like this is who I am, and the world is telling you this is an identity of right. who you are, not just a behavior that's happening. Right. Um, and uh, I struggled for many, 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 many years, but the Lord, in His intimacy. And in his salvation um, has always also been healer and deliverer. So I've experienced a lot of deliverance. I have experienced um, specific encounters with the Lord in the deepest and darkest places of my heart. And the very roots of where so certain things entered in. That then once he, once he encountered me in those places, it's as if there was no, he filled the need. So there was no longer the need to turn to these, these things to try to meet the need and fill a void in my, my, my own self. And, uh, and yeah, the, the Lord has done such a healing work in my life that today I do not struggle with same-sex attraction anymore. And I do not struggle in my gender. And, uh, you know, where before I was always when I was in this sexual brokenness, I was always assuming the masculine role. And even the, in the fantasies and in, in the activity of being with another person, um, again, I was always the one being the masculine one. And uh, the Lord has done a dramatic work of healing. And I no longer struggle with the gender insecurity or the gender confusion. And I love being a woman. <laughs> like. <laughs> And what that means and just the blessing and the benefit of being a woman and honestly having a womb yeah. to receive life and to carry life, yeah. um, whether it's in the natural or in the spirit, that's how the Lord's created me and I, and, and I fully embrace it. That's so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I do also just want to say, like, it's, like, my journey with the Lord in that process, like, my healing journey really began 20 years ago. So it's over years, and yes, there was a dark period in there, um, but, like, even on the post side of that, like, the Lord has been so faithful to actually really resolve things, and... Uh, yeah, my, my story is a story of hope. I, I just want to call attention to the, the 20 years, because I know for young adults that are like 19, 18, 21, like to think 20 years, it sounds like an eternity away, right? It sounds like 20 years. Yeah, I'm years. old, y'all. <laughs> it, really, it, it really isn't. But, I, but I, I want you to hear, what I want you to hear in that is that no matter what it is that you struggle with in your life, it doesn't have to be an LGBTQ, same-sex, homosexual, it doesn't have to be that, it can be any kind of brokenness, um, I want you to hear that there is a process, that it is a process. And what I hear from so many young adults is you get discouraged about where you are in your process. And you might have a moment where you feel weak and you just want to throw in the whole towel because you're like, oh, just forget it. And, and it, I feel like I've been fighting this for so long. And, 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 and it may feel that way. I'm not discounting that it, that it feels that way. But in reality, maybe it's been six months or maybe it's been a couple of years. Or, but, but I want you to hear is that walking with the Lord, we are all being sanctified. I'm being sanctified. Laura Allred is in a sanctification process right now. So is Gabriel. So is Lindsay. And so are you. But don't give up on that process wherever you are. Don't just stop in the middle of it and not continue to progress toward being formed into the image of Jesus. That's the goal is Christ-likeness in our lives. Yeah? 
So we had kind of a little bit of a funny story. I don't know if you want to tell them our story of writing questions. I'll get there. I'll get okay, there. Okay, okay, okay. Enough women chatter. It's okay, my turn. go. Um, so scripture says that a righteous man falls seven times. Um, the difference between a righteous person and an unrighteous person is I, I believe the, the, the posture of a righteous person is standing because you have to be, in order to fall, you have to be standing in the first place. And so the, the real division between unrighteous and unrighteous, those who wrestle to go after God versus those who just give themselves over to the flesh and darkness and all the junk, is that that will to just keep getting up again and again. And, and what I love about your story and your honesty is to talk about, I got totally free and then I had to battle again. And then I got free and, and I mean, it's like you're climbing this mountain. And like Laura was saying, there's so often we go through, through battles and we're like, I guess the battle must mean that I'm just this way. And the enemy so badly wants you to agree with what he's giving, what he suggests to you. That this, this thing, this, this rage, this lust, this, that's just who you are. So just, yeah, depression, anxiety, general anxiety, you know, um, eating disorders, all the, all the things, all the disorderedness is just who you are. And like, I want to do a teaching on this at some point, but, you know, often in the church we talk about the power of agreement. And I'm going to agree with what the Lord says. Well, I also want to talk about the power of disagreement. Because unless you really learn how to disagree with what the enemy's throwing at you or the bait that he's made you take earlier in your life, until you start saying, no, I am not given over to the lust of the flesh. I am not given over to anxiety. You have to, dis you have to go after this. And it's a battle. It is, it, is a bo it is a battle that does not stop. I was mowing the lawn a couple of days ago, and I was thinking about, you know, people that have these points of view that, well, Christianity is just easy, and it should just be easy all the time. And there's no real battle. There's no real fight because it's just easy. And, and uh, even comparing that to, like, almost passivity when it comes to, say, political views and war and stuff. And I have conversations in my head with people all the time. Whether there are people there or not, I'm talking, I'm having some kind of a debate or something. And then I, as I was mowing the corner of my house, I was thinking about talking to someone who was a pacifist, even in the spirit, you know, like, I just don't believe in warfare and battle, and saying to them, well, it's a good thing your, your body isn't a pacifist. Because if your body was a pacifist when it came to bacteria, you would immediately begin dying. And there's probably a medical condition that's, I don't know what that would be called, but if your body stops fighting, you immediately begin dying. And that's, your spiritual walk is the same. There's, there's constantly this idea of not just I think we fight enough to take ground, but we don't then maintain that ground that we've taken. Mm -hmm. We just look at everything as a battle, mm -hmm. as opposed to, I'm going to hold this ground. Now that I've defeated anxiety regarding my finances, I'm going to stand here and own this. Do you understand what I'm saying? We've got to go past just, take, just having battles. Yeah. First of all, you've got to learn how to fight. And then after you learn how to fight and have battles, then you have to learn how to maintain and stand your ground. And we're going we're gonna to start walking through some of that uh, as we go into the year. But Lindsay's testimony is this beautiful example of learning to fight and then maintain yeah. even by your fingernails yeah. mm -hmm. until, you've reached the next, until you reach the next breakthrough and the next breakthrough until you finally find and then establish and live in the freedom that God has ordained for you. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, well, just over a week ago, before we had the guys here talking and sharing their stories, Laura and I were coming up with some questions that we might be able to ask them. And I'm about to tell an embarrassing story about me. Well, it was embarrassing to me. It probably wasn't to you. But 
Um, so formulated some questions, and I think, yeah, I like questioning. I'm pretty good at asking questions. So we formulated some questions, and I, I'll, I'm going to give you kind of the punchline first, and because then I want to tell you what the question was, because I would like for Lindsay to expound on it. So I asked her a question, uh, typed it up, and we texted it to her. And then I hear her talking to, the, talking to Laura on the phone, and she so dismantled my question. <laughs> I felt this big. I, I was, I was leveled. I was embarrassed, not in a bad, not like you hurt my feet, not anything like that. Just like, oh my gosh, I am standing in the midst of like Einstein regarding this topic. And um, after they talked a little bit, I, I walked over to where Laura was, had her on speakerphone, and said, uh, "Excuse me." Miss Lindsay, um, clearly I don't know anything about this topic. I think so much so that the words that I used to form that question could have been insulting and damaging because I'm so ignorant. And I want to apologize to you. Which, of course, she did because she's gracious. And I said, I think you know my heart to know well enough, to know me well enough that I would never just try to flippantly throw some words at you to conjure up some conversation, uh, which, which she agreed to. But the question was basically, I thought it was a smart one. Before he says that, this, this is what's interesting, is that because this topic isn't talked about in the church at all, we don't even have the language. Do you understand? Like, we don't even have the language because nobody discusses this. Whenever I first was a young adult pastor, we had that. I want to preach this message again about sexual purity. I started teaching about sexual purity and why it's important. And one of the, my young adults who was raised in the house of God, I said, well, what did you think about this message? And, and they replied, honestly, I'm angry. I know anger shouldn't be the response I feel right now, but I'm angry because I've been raised in church and nobody has ever said this to me. Nobody's ever told me this. So I am like determined at TYA, you're going to be equipped and you're going to know and we're not going to be like taboo subjects on things that you see every day anyway. So go ahead and share the question. So here's, here's my eloquent ignorance. Can you describe the battle that rages in the minds of those who are still trapped behind this lie? To what you said. Took a jackhammer to. I don't have that. Do you want to read my response? I actually don't have that. Oh, I do. <laughs> do y'all want to hear Lindsay's response? Yeah. I would love to. I want it because I'm going to frame it. <laughs> so she has says. Okay, so she said this. She said, um, so I have some thoughts to share um, because I don't know how this conversation is being framed and maybe they're helpful, maybe not, do with them what you want. My initial thought was I think it would be good to soften a little with the preceding knowledge, acknowledgement about how the devil lies to all of us by tempting us to meet our legitimate needs for love and acceptance in illegitimate ways. We all can relate to that. I'm not sure how the conversation will go, but this isn't homosexuality versus heterosexuality. Because there's a heck of a lot of heterosexual brokenness that is equally sinful and grievous toward our Father. It's about pursuing love on God's holy and righteous terms and surrendering our lives to God and his standard for holy and righteous living. There are lies through a myriad of expressions of sexual brokenness and indwelling sin that attaches to desire. Y'all, she's a beast. Holy sexuality isn't just being heterosexual or for those with same-sex desires to develop heterosexual potential. I want to talk about that. It's submitting to God's sexual ethic. Holy sexuality is simply chastity and singleness and faithfulness in marriage, which is between one man and one woman. That's the gist of what you said. There's a bit more. But can, can you understand why I felt so tiny now? <laughs> I am not, I'm not easily impressed with people. I'm just, I'm more of a cat person. 
So I'm just like, eh, take it or leave it. But this woman, outside of my own wife, she, I'm, like Laura said, we as the church are so blessed to have her. Yeah. I think after hearing those we words, I think you. you understand, but we are so grateful that you're in our lives. So talk to us about um, homosexuality versus heterosexuality and that, desi and that the goal isn't to turn gay people straight. Yeah. Ta talk to us about that. Yeah, because it's... Understand, understand the question. Understand the question. She's not saying, it's fine to be gay, but it, it's just, you know. No, I think that um, in the place of sexual brokenness, again, we're all trying to meet legitimate needs that need to be met, but we are turning to something that is sinful outside the will of God to meet those needs. And um, I think where, I think you're, I think the question, part of the question that you want me to talk about is the distinction between, even though you're, you struggle with uh, homosexuality and being heter like, what was it again? The goal isn't like blue blooded heterosexuality, the goal is Jesus. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. And so um, I love, I love speak, like speaking about it in terms of what is holy sexuality. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about it. And um, just a plug for a book. One of the books that I really appreciate, and if you're, you're someone who likes to dive in deep, um, there's a, a man by the name Christopher Yuan who actually came out of a homosexual lifestyle, and he has a brilliant mind, like theologian, and he has written this book called Holy Sexuality in the Gospel. And in it, he really talks about holy, holy sexuality and really defining it in, in the way that I communicated it to you about chastity and singleness and faithfulness in marriage. And, you know, chastity and singleness, no matter what we struggle with, is really honing, like, like reining in um, the, de the sexual desires and submitting them back to the Lord and saying, I am not going to be acting on this until the gift of marriage. And where desire comes in, um, you know, not all desires are bad. I mean, God has desire. We serve a God who desires, and we are created in his image, and so, of course, we, have the, we are then created with desire. But there is also sinful desire. And um, I think that it's important to, when we have these desires of our heart, to take them before the Lord and see where they lead and wh wherever it leads will give the indicator of whether or not this is a righteous and a holy desire or if it is a sinful uh, and unrighteous desire. And of course, those things that are, that are unrighteous then get crucified. It gets given back to the Lord, like, no, this is not for me to entertain. I think this goes back to what you were talking about in terms of the difference between getting free and staying free. And... You know, the Lord talks about how we have to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And why is that important? Um, because the enemy will ride on your thoughts to create strongholds in your mind and strongholds then even in your body. And we don't want those footholds and strongholds. We want to build strongholds of God even within our mind. And so I think... Um, there's often times in the church this, well, homosexuality is bad, but heterosex heterosexuality is good. So in order to make the bad right, the person with homosexual desires, they just need to change and turn heterose heterosexual. And heterosexuality is not salvation, like building a relationship with Jesus, receiving Jesus as my savior, and then embracing the sanctification process that you talked about. And honestly, when I say that word, I'm not even confident that we all know what that means. It's actually believing that 
the cross and the power of the blood of Jesus is sufficient. And that it's not just sufficient, it has the power to transfer me out from being a slave to sin and a slave to bondage no matter what it is. And now being transformed to being a slave of righteousness. And the conforming the image of Christ and the likeness of Christ in me through and through. In my character, in my desires, in my relationships. And um, I, I think that, unfortunately, I think if I'm, I can be just kind of completely honest, I think this is, a, this is a place where the church can actually respond and do really well is let's go deep in what sanctification is. And I want to know, hey, how has the Lord sanctified you? What, what have you had to crucify and lay on the altar? And I think that you don't really hear a lot of that kind of honesty and transparency of where we have been met by the mercy of God. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, then when it comes to this issue, it could just, it feels so alienated. It just right. feels so other. Right. And I don't think it's meant to be. And I, I, I don't think it is either. And I just feel just at least opening the door to discuss it is such a big deal. And I, I think I'm just really tired of seeing it alienated or seeing people that struggle with this, like treated like, oh, you, you go over there and we'll all be over here. And we go, you know, like I, we just, we can't do that anymore, family, because that's not the, the community that God has asked us to walk in. Well, and we also need to be careful that we're not partnering with the world. Yes. That this is who you are yes. and you will forever be this way. Right. Because that's actually placing a curse upon them. Come on. And, uh, you know, the reality is Jesus' blood sets us all free. Yes. Like we're called to be free. We're called to be sons and daughters. And I just, I just, it's just a lie. Yeah. <laughs> because I think also what happens even in the post-salvation, like, hey, I'm walking with the Lord, I'm a committed disciple, things are good, there can be this taint or people even seeing me through these, through a lens of, well, I don't know if I can trust this person because they have they have had this kind of sexual brokenness in their life. And we don't treat any other sin that way, I don't right. think. No, and you know what? Even hearing you say that, I think that's a Gen X problem and a boomer problem. I don't think millennials or Gen Z have an issue with that. Am I wrong? Like, I feel like when you see someone that's free, you just see them as free. So I feel so much hope in you because I feel like this is the first generation that you guys get it, you understand, and I, I don't know, I just, I, maybe it's a pipe dream, maybe I just love you so much I'm seeing you with rose-colored glasses, but I just feel like Gen X and, and Boomers have a, a difficult time with that, but I think you guys will celebrate people's freedom, yes? Yeah. I don't know. Um, okay, so let me ask. Let me ask you this. This is one of the one of the questions that is posed to me a lot regarding this issue. How do we, as the church, um, I think a big concern is like we don't want to come across as bigots, and we don't want to come across as haters. So I feel like the the opposite of that is we just love and accept everybody, and we don't. We're not by we. I mean y'all. <laughs> this is a growth area for you. Is that Speaking truth and love is difficult for your generation because I feel like you've bought into a lie or an idea that if you disagree with someone, you don't love them. And so to show someone that you love them, you need to agree with them. But I don't believe that's true. And so can you help us as the church, if we have friends or family members that are struggling, how do we interact in a way that is um, Christ, Christ, period. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think the guys kind of touched upon this a little bit last week, but it's really approaching every person to hear their story. Like there's, there's, there's so much 
honestly power in seeing an individual and a person in front of you and asking them, what is your story? And in that, you're seeking to understand them, whether you agree with it or not. And the power of actually having someone understand you is huge. It's huge. And once you then build that place of relational trust, and there's going to be a back and forth there, right? Then you can, you know, also not only convey love in your questioning and, and bearing present, but you can also share your story. Like hopefully the conversation kind of goes both ways, right? Yes. And you're getting to know one another. And in that place of then knowing one another, you can then share the love of God in your belief system. And we don't just believe in like rules and regulations. We, we have a relationship with him. And his presence changes everything. And so even while you're having these conversations, you are bringing the presence of God and the, and the presence of the Lord in it. And I think that you have to, to learn to not only listen to the person, but to listen to the Holy Spirit at the same time. And he might give you powerful questions to ask that draw things up and out of them in a way. Um, but then also he might give you words of knowledge. He might give you, give you words of encouragement. Like you might be able to see through the eyes of Jesus where they actually need him. And then you can be that vessel then to supply his love and his healing into their heart. And that's, that is a high place of honor. Yeah. Like, and um, I think it's just being genuine with one another and learning how to communicate in ways that are, that is respectful, that is loving, but also conveys the truth. I mean, even when I was estranged and far off away from God, I had people in my life who were, who were telling me the truth. And to be honest, I, I, I was enraged. Like I, I had a, a response of rage because the struggle was so fierce that it felt so unattainable, the truth that they were saying to me. And did the truth push you further away or did it like tell us like, you, you responded in rage, because I think that's the concern, right? Is if yeah. we speak truth, we're going to push someone further away from God. So I wasn't enraged at them. I was enraged at the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in some sense, my rage was actually going into Jesus, because I was offended at his truth and offended at him, more so than I was at them telling me what the truth was. Um, and I think if you're on the receiving end of that rage or that anger or that hurt, it's also good to know that Christ is the one that's actually receiving it. Um, what's really interesting about the people who were bold enough to speak the truth, they did speak it to me in love. Yeah. And there was a time when I had literally no hope and I was walking with um, a pastor and his wife, and the, it was right after I got out of the DC psych ward because I had tried to commit suicide. I was Baker acted, and I come out of that, and I'm talking about this place of literally being in utter despair. Like, there was no hope. It was a very inhuman place to be. And she just looked at me and said, that's okay. I'll hope for you. Yeah. And I want to go back to even what you said about being with um, this young man that you've been discipling with and saying, hey, I don't know what to do. I want to be with you. And, I, and, and the Lord brought specific people to me to bear with me. And some of that bearing with was in the healing journey, and it was good, and, and it, was, it was glorious, although difficult. <laughs> But then some of that was in that dark period where I was enraged and offended. Um, 
And those were the people that I went to and had furthering relationship and intimacy with them, even on the flip side of when the Lord started softening my heart and started, you know, going through this process of, of restoration again with me. And it's so, it's, it's the ones that aren't afraid to speak the truth that you know that you can trust. Because if the truth is given in love, like, that's Jesus, and he's the most trustworthy one. Amen. And, I, and I, I just want to give a plug to the Lord in terms of where, like, the Lord didn't spare me from feeling great pain mm. in a variety of different places throughout the years. Yeah. And there was a purpose to that, but I, I got to identify with Christ's suffering on the cross and see him in a way as nobody else can relate to me in the level of this pain. Nobody else can feel your pain. Nobody could feel my pain. But Jesus did, and he does. Yeah. And I would, I, I would take that pain, and I literally would envision him on the cross and, like, thrust it into his wounds to try to get it up and out of me and into him. And it was a process that, that, that bore fruit. Um, it was one way that the Lord was teaching me how to fight. Um, yeah. Um, I, in regards to being, loving people in this, you know, walking with people well in this season, I just have this aspiration for TYA that we will be a place where people can come here who are struggling with all kinds of things and they won't feel rejection and they won't feel ostracized or alienated. That's really a dream in my heart. And I feel, and I don't want to make an overgeneralization. I don't like to speak in generalizations. But I do feel like it's my experience here at TYA has shown me that it seems to be difficult, more difficult for guys to embrace someone that has SSA. If you're like heterosexual, like there's almost like this homophobic thing. Um, Luis tells this story about how he went to a men's group. And he said it publicly, so I'll share his story. <laughs> he went to men's group, and all these men are standing around the table saying, yeah, I'm struggling with pornography. And they raise their hand, like, I'm struggling with lust. I've major lust issues. And they're raising their hand, you know, talking about their struggles. And then Luis raises his hand and says, well, I struggle with same-sex attraction and, and watching gay porn. And he said the place with this men's group that had been welcoming to him where they had been previously welcoming him with hugs and what's up, bro, and all that stuff. All of a sudden, those hugs turned to handshakes. And the men didn't know how to interact with him once they knew what his issue was. And I've seen that play out here at TYA. And I'm, I don't fault anyone for that. I think a part of the issue is we don't talk about it, right? We're not a family. and We don't discuss these issues. And so we've never really talked about how to to do that, but I just want to just put it out there to, to the guys. I'm going to go, I mean, it's 837 if we want to go back into worship, but um, I just want to invite the young men of the house just to invite the Holy Spirit to show you where and how you can love well someone who is so opposite of you that you wouldn't be threatened to embrace someone who may be struggling, you wouldn't be threatened to just grab someone and just hug them and even hold them in a, in a hug and embrace because it's showing the love of Jesus. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I feel like it needs to be said and we just need to grow in that area. So I know, can I speak to that just a little bit and we'll go back into worship. Um, but I know for, for me in my life, the more that I... Um, grow secure in my relationship with God and that he actually really becomes my security. And the more that I am vulnerable with God and he actually meets me in that place and then shores up the vulnerable places with his strength, um, I can actually bear with another person. I'm given more capacity to bear with them. And so I, I would challenge that when, when you feel that, ah, 
and I know it's real. Um, and I know that, that there, there can be a certain type of brokenness where you can feel the need so strongly that they're trying, they're trying to, they're trying to grasp for, for life and in and, in and, in and from you. But if you are secure in the Lord and the Lord, like you're fully aware that Christ is in you, you will not be afraid to then freely give in that upright posture Jesus and the hugs and the conversations and the eye contact and the embraces and the, the invitations to, to dinner or to come to, you know, to, to join, to join things um, because you're not threatened. He's not threatened. The Lord, Jesus was never threatened by someone's brokenness. And, you know, one of the things that you've mentioned uh, that you even repented of last Monday was how those who, who deal with LGBTQ sexual brokenness have been treated like lepers in the church. And that is, it, it so is like, true. It's like a modern day leprosy. Yes. And even, even in, in my uh, younger years, I literally would phrase it that way, that I even felt like a leper, also that anybody I touched or anybody I came in contact with, I would infect. And so I think it can work both ways. But what did Jesus do? What did he do? And he healed the lepers. He wasn't afraid to touch them. And I think that is, that is the challenge to the church. And if you know and if you're aware of anything inside that I'm not ready to do that or I don't have the capacity to do that, then that's where you start with the Lord in your heart. Yeah, Romans 2 says that it's, it says, don't you know it's, it's the kindness or the goodness of God that leads us to repentance? And we, we accept that for ourselves, and we lean into his kindness over us. But when we see somebody else, when they, especially if they have a sin that we don't like, <laughs> I think we're okay with people that have normal sins or sins that, that we're okay with. But if it's ones that we think are unnatural sins, or those aren't the good sins. These are the good sins over here, and these are the not good sins over here. Uh, we don't care about extending kindness to them. We want to see judgment go and we want judgment and things to push them out of their sin. When that's not what, it's, it's the kindness that leads us to, to, to revolutionize the way we think that draw us out of those dark places. Well, and we're all in the process of, like, we all have to die. Like, we all have to crucify our flesh. And it's not just us crucifying our flesh, it's, it's the power, appropriating the power of the blood of Jesus that actually, in, that gives us the grace to be able to do so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's dead. Yeah. And, you know, learning, like actually being in touch with your own death, <laughs> but also your own resurrection to then bear with those that are in the process of dying, but also then to be the, the life givers and the undergirding of, no, this is where we're going. We're going unto resurrection life. We're going unto resurrection power with complete freedom and doing so together. And I, and I, and I think... Uh, like, I think there's also a warning, too, like, even the, the popularizing of sin. Yeah. Like, for some reason, it's, yeah. really, it's really popular uh, pornography. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Pornography and masturbation. And we kind of gloss over it yeah. as being common. And then when it comes to same-sex attraction or someone who is really confused in their gender and wants to be the other gender or thinks that they should be. That is so unpopular that it then, it does, it gets pushed out into this other camp, yeah. which is the leper's camp, and you got to stay in the unclean part of the church 
when we're really all in the same place. We really are. And I just want to challenge that. Yes. So, like, I know this is a very different type of, of service. Like, I, I don't, are we going to go back into worship? Are we going to do key? We're not going to go back into worship. Thank you, Demorian. Um, we were going to go back into worship. But I feel like this conversation is so important for us to have and for you to be equipped and for, and for us to have. So it's not like a fiery message. We're like, ah, glory of God. But, the, but, we, but we can't just camp out there and not be equipped and discuss these issues. And I just have this determination that we're going to be a community that is not afraid to embrace everyone, that is not afraid to talk openly. This is why, again, this is my plug for Thursday night, again, for the 15th time. Because it's in that context, in group, that you can, that we can go deep with one another like this. That we can have these conversations, that we can embrace one another. Um, the world is after, they are after you. They are after you and they are after your children. I was talking to a mom this week and she was like, my young adult kids are like, why do we care? It's not a big deal. We don't care what people do. And she's like, you should care. It is important that we as the children of God bear, carry the standard of the cross and the freedom of the cross and what it stood for. And so that's why it's important for us to have these conversations. That's why I'm going to introduce and we're going to make time to discuss things like this because I want you to be equipped. Well, and it's important to bring things into the light. I mean, once you bring things into the light, the things that were once hidden deeds in darkness lose their power. Yes. So you're actually becoming a group of people that can actually be sons and daughters of light, that you are called as children of light, children of day, and the power of light that expels darkness. Because as soon as light shows up, darkness has to flee. Yes. And so can we be a people with all of ourself in the light, yes. with all of my heart in the light? Yes. So this is what I'd like to do. Can we, I want, let's just stand. And Lindsay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to pray over us. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask her to pray over us as a community. I'm going to ask her to pray over us as a community that we can grow in embracing one another, grow in vulnerability, grow in healing, grow in a space and creating a place where we can journey together, where we can link arms with one another and walk each other into righteousness. Come on, TYA, don't you long, don't you long for an authentic community that we can link arms with one another and just walk and usher each other into righteousness. We can walk each other into healing and into wholeness where no one feels alone or feels alienated. Where our truth, the truth of the gospel isn't compromised. We get to walk each other into righteousness, but we also get to rejoice with one another and celebrate one another. It's not just about the intense things. It's also about like beating someone in a game of trash. You know what I'm saying? You don't know what I'm saying. Cards. Okay. But Lindsay, can you just pray over us and can we just receive a blessing? I feel like we're being, I feel like the Lord just wants to commission us into new levels of vulnerability and new levels of honesty and new levels of heart connect that actually bring forth the glory of the Lord. That his glory is seen through us as we commit to do life with one another on this level. Will you pray for us, Lindsay? God, I thank you that you are a God of light. And I just declare over you, let there be light. And I ask that as I say that, Lord, and as I speak that over this people, that the power of your word, your creative word of power would be made manifest in their hearts, 
and in their lives and in their friendships and in their families and in this community. Let there be light. You are a child of light. And I bless you with face-to-face -face communion with your Abba Father in heaven, that the light of his countenance would be upon your face. And I bless you to turn, that where there needs to be a turning of posture towards the Lord, that there is grace, the empowering grace of the Lord to do so. And I bless you as a community to receive the fullness of the power of grace. That this would be a grace house, a grace hub of extravagant grace. Extending the power of his wonder working blood. And I bless you with the ability to give your heart wholeheartedly to the Lord. Even in the places of secret sin, that there would be no hiddenness between you and the Lord. He is there already. In Psalm 39, it says that in even the depths of Sheol, he is there. And I just, I just proclaim the presence of God in your deepest, darkest places. And that it would actually be a place for encounter with the Lord. That you would encounter his love. That you would encounter his heart. And that you would become a community that actually be, that becomes a people that can do that together yeah. with one another, but also for the stranger and the foreigner that comes into your house and into your dwelling. And so I bless you with the perfect love of God that has no fear. There is no fear here. There is no fear and there's no shame. I bless you as those who can see in light where there is fear and where there is shame and that you become so fierce to see that thing leave because they don't belong in the kingdom but love and righteousness and holiness and peace and gentleness 